We start off with a prayer. Om Stapakaya Chadalmasya Salva Dharma Swarupine Avatara Varishtaya Ram Krishnaya De Namaha Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Vavatu Sahaviryam Karavavahai De Jasvina Vaditam Mastuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Ramakrishna establishment of universal religion applicable to all beings, embodiment of all religions. To the noblest of divine incarnations, I offer my salutations. This prayer, because this is the Titi Puja of his great, great Nitya Siddha, this Ishwarakoti called Swami Niranjanananda, who is, as I say, Titi Puja, birthday celebration is today. And also the normal prayer, may that one protect us both, may that one nourish us, may we work together with great vigor and energy, may our study be illuminating, may we not unnecessarily cavil with each other, peace, peace, peace be unto all. Now we can happily take questions. Regarding um, what we were talking, what you were talking about yesterday, the flash of lightning, the winking of the eye, that aha experience, and because we we can't know it, we can't observe it. What what is that? Is that a revelation or a realization? that can't be expressed in words. And if I understand it, and I could be wrong, if the mind is devoid of consciousness, but it is because of the Atman that it's like a mirror and reflects consciousness. So is it from that aha point where we say, I get it, that realization comes that the Atman or Brahman illumines every mental experience. Yes, that's exactly right, because don't forget, you can't express something that has no perishable parts. And there's a reason why we call it revelation. There's a reason why we call it realization. We realize something. And we have examples of that in our normal life, isn't it? That we, we get it. You know, when we do the Enneagram, we say, wait for the aha moment. And then there's a series of mini versions of that. And every day we say, oh, yes, that's why I do this. And that's it. And that's that. So that's on the personality plane of things. When we come to spiritual life, there's that inner revelation. And it's conditioned, though, on purity of mind. So spiritual practice is cleaning the mind, filling it with the higher, nobler values. If we read the Bhagavad Gita, the 16th chapter gives us a whole range of what we should be doing, what we should be avoiding. Things which are described as divine and demonic is how it's interpreted. That means things that will be against us and things which will give us pain, actions that are basically egocentric actions and other actions which are devoid of that, which are full of generosity of spirit that have all the illuminating factors in it. So there is a revealing aspect to nature itself. And when that dawns us, in the context of the Upanishad that we were studying, Ken Upanishad, it was around the story how Indra got this revelation. Oh, that's who you are, I see. And so it was like a flash of lightning because also, you, you know, in physics, there is nothing seemingly faster than the speed of light. Now, I know some of you don't want me to bring physics up, but I'm going to do it anyhow. You see, at the quantum level, there is no such thing as the speed of light going on. 
something spontaneously happens at the same time. We can call it quantum leap or quantum tunneling, uh, things like that. Entanglement, quantum entanglement. That means two particles meet together, no matter how far they are dispersed apart. They simultaneously change. That's actually been proven. There's no question about it, but it's a mystery. Now, if that happens on the fundamental physical level, imagine, and it's demonstrating a fundamental oneness. So that's a revelation because normally we think in terms of separateness. I have a job in a separate place. You have a job in a separate place. I have a set of separate fam family members. My father is like this. My mother is like that. My house is like this. My bank account is like that. It's all me and mine. And that means we put ourselves in a kind of bubble where we sit in one corner of it as a central component and try to deal with life from that headquarters. And we can't do it. We can't do it because there are overwhelming forces we have to deal with, unexpected things. Now, if we take ourselves out of that context and look at things, shift our understanding in a different way, very, very quickly, as quicker than the speed of light, we get a revelation. Why? Because it's already there. And as soon as you move something out of the way, it is self-evident. Like if you have no understanding where the sun is and a cloud is perpetually covering it, when the cloud moves off, ah, then you see the sun. When smoke clears, you see the fire. When uh, a woman is pregnant, you can't see the fetus because the womb is in the way, bump is in the way. So things are hidden. These are exam examples that are contained in the Bhagavad Gita. Snow, smoke and fire, the cloud and sun, the embryo and so on. All of these are examples taken as nothing from me. So when things clear, we get a, a revelation and it might be a glimpse. It might be like a flash of lightning that we get it. And the more we clear the mind, the more we practice it, the more we experience that, the more we understand the permanency of it. So I give the example I often give before. Supposing I have a, a, an old fashioned house with a tin roof and it has a small hole in, and the sun is shining, on my floor, a small circle will be there. Sunlight comes in, there's a small circle. And then I don't relate the circle to the roof, but if the hole gets bigger, a bigger spot on my floor happens. And the wider I make the hole in the roof, the broader my sun spot on the floor becomes. If I take the whole roof off, the whole room is flooded. In that same way, if I take away all the obscuring obstacles which are there in the mind, then the full revelation comes to me. And the best thing for is for that to happen progressively, bit by bit. So we have to engage in a, a, a cultural program where we learn to shift the mind in a different way. And the mind, of course, is subject to all the inputs that were there, not just in this life, but previous lives. So that becomes what we call habit. A repeated thing gets settled in the unconscious mind, the habit area, and that becomes our so-called normal behavior, is not necessarily good for us. So everything that we do, everything that we think, settles into a kind of stuck area called the unconscious mind and gets replayed. We draw from that stock, but there are good things also. There are good memories. Now the art of doing this is to select the good memories, select the useful things and bring them out and allow that to saturate your mind, bring out the values of truth and beauty and goodness and love and harmony, generosity of spirit, 
service to others, bring it all out until it saturates the mind. And in brief, the most useful thing therefore is to deepen love of God. If you only have one request, it should be, may my love of God, my, my yearning for God, yearning for truth, may it deepen so that it completely saturates the whole mind. So one question that came to me by WhatsApp, and I'll, I'll read it out. So it's like this. So what are the roles of A, rationality or intellect? And B, feelings. And C, sensing from experience when we discriminate between the good and bad in spiritual life. All right. Of course, the role of the last one is essential for all of us. We have to discriminate. Discernment is the first starting point. Why is that? Because we get engrossed in the so-called world and endorse it as our real thing, not as a way of look, seeing the world through a framework. And the time and space provide us with the framework, but we have a perceiving apparatus. We can consider it like a machine, perceiving apparatus. And we see the world and we see it as a reality, but it's not exactly like that. Things only exist when we see them, when we hear them, when we touch them, when we taste them. And if you want an endorsement of that, you go to the Brittaranyaku Upanishad, which tells us that. In advance of modern science, where at the quantum level and quantum physics, it also tells us this. Things only exist, they're kept in a kind of holding area until we perceive them and then they become our reality. But our gut doesn't tell us this. Uh, so-called normal experience denies it. And so we have to now shift our understanding in line with scripture, in line with what is the truth. That means we have to take on spiritual practice that has two components. The first component is this discernment, discriminating between what is real, what is unreal. That's why that prayer is there, that famous peace prayer derived from the Pratarinku Upanishad. Lead me from the unreal to the real. Lead me from darkness to light. Lead me from death to immortality. Lead us in this way. So how does that work in the different forms of spiritual discipline described as yogas? Bear in mind, we should integrate all these approaches. We are not exclusively thinking people, exclusively feeling people, exclusively willing and doing people, even though from personality development courses such as Enneagram, we understand that we are out of sync. We're emphasizing as a survival strategy, one of these more than the others. They all have to be in harmony and balance. And it's not a question of whether we have an allocation of feeling or an allocation of doing. Supposing God stands in front of you. You imagine that. Lord of the universe as your chosen ideal, knocks on your door, enters your house, sits on your sofa. What will you do? Will you say, I only have five ounces of feeling for you today? Or I only have uh, a limited amount of tea that I can offer you? Or I'll go to the store and get whatever is required, isn't it? And the store has much more than may be in your grocery cupboard. You won't say, let me now ask an intellect-based question. Let me ask how I will reason something out. And since you are here and so on, then uh, maybe I only can ration, ration my reasoning to, to a certain extent, the whole universe in front of me with the Lord of the universe sitting there. Then I decide that maybe I should ration my rationalization. All of these things we require, why do we require them? because there are evidences of what we call sat ananda 
Satchidananda, we said in one phrase, broken down as Sat existence itself, not a quality. It's actually saying what is not there. See, what we know that something exists. It is existence itself. We're not nihilists. We don't say nothing is there. Say, actually, the everything that we call universe and beyond the scope of our thoughts, imaginations, and so on, all of that is one thing, and it is existence itself. Existence itself, rather than the expression of it through space and time. Space and time, when you add it, that becomes evidence of existence itself. It's why everything wants to live and survive. Nobody says, let me die now. Everyone has an urge to eat and drink and sleep and uh, propagate the species and every organic living thing has it. And unbeknown to you, unseen by you, every atom has it. Every atom wants to sustain itself. Why would an atom have an arrangement that keeps it going? through a, an exclusion principle and keeping the electron in an uncertain position and keeping all that buzzing. This is called life. All of life is essentially atomic and it is sentient. If you put a rock on a plumb line on a piece of string to find out where something is, central part of something is, then the rock knows where the center of the earth is. Don't tell me it's insentient. It knows where the center of the earth is. The electron knows where the proton is. The sun knows where the moon is. The earth knows where the sun is. All the planets know where each other are and make an orbit. The Milky Way knows where Andromeda is. Don't tell me these are all insentient things. They're infused with life. If the existence itself, that existent entity before the earth was, stood there and wove an earth around itself, a cocoon around itself. We can put it in scientific terms, that's okay. And we can apply poetry. Is it useful to apply, uh, to apply the full capacity of your creative imagination? Yes. You're living in a world that is fraught with imagination, with imaginary ghosts all around you from the past. And imagining, imagined frightening, contrived situations in the future that have not yet arrived. <laughs> Instead of understanding this existent one is here is now, it's fully existent. Not only that, it's, chit, it's consciousness itself. And consciousness itself means that everything is sentient. And it is also ananda, bliss, happiness, joy. Why else would we require a sense of humor? Why else is there something that tickles? And uh, There's no, no real reason for it. It's a great mystery. It's a subject of a scientific investigation why we should want to do it. Some people say, well, you see that, uh, that uh, mammals got used to being tickled or something like that, you see. Whatever it may be, everything is coming from a source, ananda. We want happiness. As I keep saying, I never met anybody who sat down and said, my goal, Swamiji, is to be unhappy. I wish to be as miserable as possible, unless you li live in the UK or something. I don't know. <laughs> but my goal is to be completely unhappy. Nobody says it. Everybody is looking for happiness. Everybody is looking for what is the greatest maximum pleasure. Of course, we may be using it within the framework, the mistaken understanding that this world is reality. So we require discrimination. And if you practice jnana yoga, it is all, that's the whole practice. You're not this, you're not that. The reality is not this, not that. But the reality I catch as something pouring through everything, expressing itself through everything, through every hand, through every eye, through every limb, 
all of that is being expressed, then what about the bhakti yoga? Yes, we require discrimination because when our love of God increases, then our love of the world de decreases. Our love of material pleasure decreases when our joy and our love of God increases. And we employ that. Now, because we cannot see this entity that has no perishable parts and no evolution and cannot be perceived by our perceiving apparatus, we are given the capacity to imagine. The only thing is we misuse it and imagine all the negative things, brings out all doubts and fears and temptations and so on. It's all an imagined world. This is a world of Maya. This is an apparitional world. But it gives us the opportunity to use that. Wherever you look, imagine God and his angels everywhere with the heightened sense of imagination and specifically use it. The one most wonderful technique in meditation is fantasy meditation, constructive uh, fantasy from your storehouse of experience. Heighten it up. Imagine now a blue sky representing infinity. Make it like a Walt Disney sky. Make it bluer than blue. Make the fields greener than green. Make the water sparkling, more than sparkling champagne. Do that. Use the full capacity of your imagination to counter imagination. Lord Ram Krishna put it this way. You have a thorn in your foot. You take another thorn and take it out. You use Maya to deal with Maya. Maya has a revealing capacity that we mentioned before. This mother Maya is our mother Maya and has two aspects, a Vidya Maya and Vidya Maya. It can cloud us over. It, can, it, it is ignorance. It is the clothing. If you imagine that this Maya in a feminine form, all the clothing is there. The veil is there. The veil over the mother's face is there. The wonderful example of this Mahamaya in living as a living personality is Sri Sharadi Devi. And today, of course, is, as I mentioned, birthday of Swami Niranjananda. So I'll just remove this and refer to it later. Niranjananda. He was, one outstanding thing was, in a day where the divinity of Holy Mother Sharada Devi wasn't really fully recognized. He was overlooked. Sri Ramakrishna was such an outstanding personality, such an astounding phenomena, that at a moment's notice, she'd go into ecstasy of varying kinds. He had the capacity to withdraw from man and enter into God, into the divine fully and do the other way around. And he had always had one foot in both areas, but there was no external evidence for that for the Holy Mother. To all intents and purposes, an ordinary rural woman. But it was Swami Niranjananda who understood fully her divinity. And Swami Vivekananda said, I can give, I can forgive Niranjan a thousand faults because of this great, great devotion and love and realization of this divinity of the Holy Mother. So Niranjananda was one of those uh, Ishwar Kotis that was, when an incarnation comes, is the idea, he comes with a whole group of companions and Swami and uh, uh, Sri Krishna noticed in him the characteristic of Rama. He certainly was manly, not in a gender sense, but in a quality sense. He had a strong physique and he had a temperament that was feisty and fiery. And Ram Krishna admired so much his level of straightforwardness and truthfulness. He said it as it was, but like everybody else, he had to balance things. We're talking primarily of balancing things, isn't it? 
So he had to balance things. And so look at the beautiful way that Ramakrishna taught people in general, but Niranjananda in particular. As some of you know, Niranjananda was very talented in the psychic area. And spiritualist mediums got hold of him and used him. And he first visited Ramakrishna because he had heard of Ramakrishna's power, potency. Now, instead of Ramakrishna saying, leave off all these ghosts and goots and spirits and all that, it's not doing you any good. He puts it this way. Which would you prefer? Would you prefer a world of ghosts and ghouls and all that, spirits? Or would you prefer eternal life and moksha, freedom? It's up to you. Naturally, Nalanjana chooses the latter. You see, instead of saying, putting his finger out and saying, don't do this, do this, he puts it subtly. Which would you prefer? And this is the choice we all have. This is called Viveka. The choice of going, doing one thing versus another, as well from an evaluation, which is more worthwhile, which is real, which is unreal. God is real. The rest, flaky. The rest is only relative real. It's only there when the senses pick it up. We have to get used to this idea. So the second part of the spiritual practice will be detachment. It's not that we remove ourselves and go into a cave. In the Bhagavad Gita, Arjun wanted to do that. He wanted to get out of an awkward situation. And he was calling it and thinking of it as sannyas, renunciation. No, it's actually what he was doing was he was bypassing his responsibilities. And so Krishna, to his surprise, says, no, no, no. You have to engage in this activity, unpleasant as it may be at the moment. But that is what you have to do. You have to do the most righteous thing, the thing that is full of sattva, the full thing that will purify your mind. It will be different for everybody. You engage in that. So not detachment in that sense, but detachment in a kind of effectual sense. If we are fully discerning everything and choosing the right activities, Faced with two options, two paths, what is called shreyas and prayas, if we are choosing the optimal path. There's a, the great songster and great mystic and great poet and great musician, Tyagaraj. The one episode in his song, he's faced with some options and he decides to have a dialogue with his mind, oh my mind, choose oh my mind. Which do you want? He was invited to a king's palace for a big feast. Naturally, many people will say, oh, big feast, because happiness is an urge. Pleasure is an urge. But he was able to revise it, review it, stand back, and use his reasoning capacity, his intellect. In doing that, he was asking, choose our mind. Do you want this feast? which will last five minutes, or do you want the eternal bliss of Rama on the other side? Which do you choose, O oh mind? You want to fill up with the nectar of bliss derived from companionship and closeness and oneness, the delight of the Lord's company. You want to drink this honey of bliss that happen, that comes from within, or do you want this outside thing that will last five minutes and satisfy the senses not, maybe for five minutes? And so he decided the latter, he declines the invitation. So we all have to use this discrimination. Reasoning has to be there. And when we come across uh, the presentation of what is the right thing to do, or what is the truth about something, when we make that investigation, we have to be scientific in our approach. Scientific means, you see, Raja Yoga, Vivekananda calls the science of religion. That is that we have to take something 
on the basis of credible authority. We call this scripture. The words of a great saint or sage, the experience of a great entity who says, I have seen the truth, I have experienced the truth firsthand. And the promise, you also can do it. And here's what you do, some do's and don'ts, some structural manual on how to behave, some guidelines. You do that on that basis, but it has to be reasonable, it has to be rational. That's the second quality. And then the third is practicing it. Practicing it means catching the emotions up. So I have a question, how much emotion should we get before we become, uh, you know, uh, pure sentimental, pure sentiment. What's wrong with sentiment? Now, what is described as sentiment which is not rewarding is any sentiment that weakens one. Love of God is always strengthening and should be done 100%. And Swami Vivekananda said, given the option of reasoning or the intellect, and the heart, always use the heart. The heart should always be the priority. And it is because of a lack of that that Swami Vivekananda was moved to express this love through the hands, uplifting the poor, seeing God there, doing something about it. It moved his heart. But up to then, heartless. The British, the British Raj were heartless. And those people engaged in uh, religious doctrine and dogma and so on were also heartless. Jesus came across the same thing. Ram Krishna came across the same thing. Ram Krishna on a pilgrimage sponsored by Montu Borba, his benefactor, they were going, they had to engage a whole train, bringing along so many provisions, so many people dedicating such wealth to a pilgrimage. Ram Krishna sees in a village people who are starving and poor, who require clothing. He says, I'm not going to budge from here until you give something, please. And Matu Baba says, if I give, then we won't have enough money for the concluding our pilgrimage. And Ram Krishna says, well, I'm going to stay here. I won't move. I'll be with these poor people until you do something. If you don't do something, I'll stay here. Oh, no, Father, Father, all right, let me give something. So his whole understanding that Jiva is Shiva is all based on feeling. Be generous with your feeling. Feeling should take the priority. But sentimentality, mere sentimentality, of course, is different. It'll be weakening. So there's a difference between empathy and sympathy. We should always have empathy. We should always feel what the other person is feeling. All communication is essentially trying to communicate feeling. I'm trying to get you to understand what I'm feeling. I'm trying to do it through speech and language. Do you get it? I'm not giving you facts and figures. You can get that from Google. But if you want to understand the person, you have to do it on the feeling level. And we know that all behavioral aberrations are all because of an original wound somewhere deep in you. It, it comes from your childhood. That we know, that psychology understands. And so we have no room to criticize anybody because we didn't understand that person is intrinsically suffering. All humanity is suffering. Very few exceptions. If the enlightened one, it would be the exceptions. They're also suffering, but they manage the suffering. They can detach from the suffering. They engage the suffering. They have enough compassion to say, you don't suffer, let me suffer for you. This is love, pure love. God is love. And so why should that all these things be? Because that fundamental entity is existence itself, is consciousness itself, and his bliss itself. And we summarize this very often as life, light, and love. What is that supreme entity? It comes out as the capacity to illumine, the capacity to survive, 
and the capacity to find the greatest pleasure and happiness. The fact that it's all diverted into biological areas, it only means that this is evidence of this supreme source that has these characteristics, so to speak, not really characteristics in, in terms of objective characteristics, but essential ingredients, essential essences, that that Brahman is existence itself. It's not non-existent. This consciousness itself, pure consciousness, where we get all our awareness from, and it is absolute bliss. So this is the nature of this fundamental entity that we call Brahman. And so when we emphasize one thing or the other thing, we've got it wrong. God is not only existence and not consciousness. It is not only bliss and not existence. All three are necessary. And when we balance these things in our own personality, it becomes useful to us. We become, we, we, we become equally doing equally feeling and equally thinking. But without, you see, without the feeling, without compassion, where are you? Without this uh, capacity to reason, to reason things out, then you become a howling fanatic. All right, so let me see if I now fully answered your question. So coming back, so what are the roles of rationality or intellect, feelings, sensing from experience and so on? And what is the role of creative imagination in spiritual life? It's a primary role. The role of creative imagination is primary. We have the capacity to do it. We should use it. We shouldn't restrain it on the basis that we're already using it in a negative way. So we have to counter it by using it in a delightful, positive way. Use our full capacity of your imagination. When you see a person in front of you, with the full capacity of your imagination, see God in that person with all the glory of angels around and glory and light. And where do we draw the line to ensure it doesn't become a mere sensible thing? I think we answered that question. All right, so we'll leave that question aside. Assume it's being answered. We'll verify. Person who asked the question, does that make sense to you? Yes, Swami, yes, but I need to think more on this. No, you don't. <laughs> because you see what you're doing when you do all that. Uh, you, you're emphasizing an area and putting things out of balance. And you see, being in touch with your feelings is the most important thing. Most important. That uh, anything else makes you cold and unfeeling. Religion has a whole abundance of cold, unfeeling behavior. We have to engage in religion as realization. So love of God. Love of God doesn't require thinking about it. Love of God requires expression connection and expression. And we develop love of God because God is lovable, because we see that the God's grace pouring everywhere, even the capacity to think, even the capacity to speak, is all this grace pouring forth. And thinking blocks it. I'm not saying be unthinking. I'm, seeing, I'm saying make your priority feeling. That's for everybody. The more feeling we have, the more compassion we have in this world. This world is problematic because there's a lack of compassion, a lack of feeling, dealing with people, vulnerable people, children, refugees, in an unfeeling way. This is why Swami Vivekananda, he, all his rationale, giving the philosophy is all based on may I remove your suffering. Buddha's whole Buddhism was based on compassion. See the difference. <laughs> Leave the 
leave the philosophy and all of that, and the, you know the the uh, the geometry of all of that. Leave that in uh, intellectual discourses, which don't go anywhere, really. Intellectual gymnastics will not get you a vision of God. It'll prepare only a structure for it, which is necessary, no doubt. But we shouldn't emphasize it. Nor should we fall into blind faith. We should use, ra use rationale and thinking as a resource that will verify for us something. But practice has to catch it up. It's the emotion that has to be worked on because we are led astray by emotion. You may be think you are the most rational person on the planet, but actually you're swayed primarily by emotion. Let me give you an example that I often give. So this is a repetition. So I always paint a scenario to illustrate the point. So supposing you have a lawn, some 30 foot lawn, and I give you a plank 20 foot by about two foot broad. And I say, please walk along this thing. You can walk, you can skip. Then I say, take a bicycle and do it. You can happily do it. You know you won't get off onto the grass. Then I say, let's take that plank and put it over a chasm. We, the other day we had a, something like a, a travelogue on Zimbabwe. And we saw the Victoria Falls there. And the thing falls, plunges so many meters. Anyway, you take a chasm like that and you put the plank across and you put a bag of money on the one side. Five million, five million euros. It's all yours. If you can negotiate this plank, you don't have to put a bicycle there, just walk across on one condition. Two weeks in advance, we put you in front of a film show. Every day for three, four hours, you watch people attempting to do this, uh, staggering and falling off to their death with the appropriate falling sounds, you know. And then now you do it, you'll hesitate. But this is the same plank you walked and skipped and rode a bicycle on. There's no difference. So you see what was in the way, emotion was in the way, fear was in the way, doubt was in the way. What is our antidote? Love of God. And love of God not as an external thing, but love of God internally, imminent, in every breath, in every movement. Be thankful. Thankful for its presence. And put yourself then in a loving position. Whether it's the position of a child toward a parent or a friend toward a companion. Whatever your role is, whatever your power is, establish it, entrench it. And make every breath and every movement an expression of love. Because the, the rationale about it is gone. That's all contained in the Shastra and from these talks and what have you. What about practice, please? Much better. Be a loving person. That's the only thing we need to do is be a loving person. Okay. The alternative is to think about being a loving person. You'll never do it. <laughs> Will you make me some tea? I'll think about it. After one week, what happened to the tea? <laughs> I love you. Will you make me tea? No, 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 no. I can't do that. Don't have enough time. Well, where's the love? <laughs> See, like that. All right. Any further questions? We have 15 minutes more. Swami, so just one more question. Mm -hmm. um, so when we discern between the real and the unreal, uh, is the discernment about how, how long this object or something is going to be there? Like if I have a tea, the taste is there for, let's say, 15 minutes. Is it about the time 
that i engage with that particular thing is that the frame of you know uh, thinking on that no we can put it very simply you see god there in everything and not only in everything but through everything so that really is the path of uh, vivek the path of discernment is you see you can put in a negative way to say that the reality is not this but there has to be the positive side that it says it is this something is there and the easiest way to do it is to see god in everything now we want go one step further because if you are of an have an intellect disposition you have to add feel feel that god in there feel that presence pouring through everything every limb every hand every head that's the way that is really the path of discernment swami how do you do that when you're faced with someone or a situation that's you know they're they're not very kind or you know you're in that situation and you're trying to see god in that person and it's very very challenging oh, it's challenging if you're trying to do anything forget about trying to do it do it see there has to be there has to be some basis you see although i'm I, i'm saying that uh, the intellect should be should be it is always automatically overrun by emotion and therefore we have to cultivate the emotion the intellect also has to be there consciousness is there as well so we also have to have a rational basis that is why we're giving this vedanta series and so on is to give you a framework that that is uh, grounds for how you behave and how you react having understood all that the next thing is to practice it and do it so that means then that you're playing the game if you understand that this life is a game you play it and you play it very well now the example for this is every december and so on in the uk and here in ireland and so on it's a cultural thing there's such a thing as a pantomime in a pantomime there are a number of different players that are required villains are required a chorus is required a hero is required a heroine is required a pantomime dame is required and the audience for some reason or other booing and hissing is also required and cheering is also required but it is a pantomime nonetheless and all these components are necessary that means if a villain comes to you you'll hiss and you'll boo and you'll deal with it but you won't take it seriously you won't take it personally you'll still see god there you still still see that the plot the scenery the players the parts the roles is all one entity all one player is there what we call god god is all of that now the the understanding of it comes from our philosophical study the practice of it comes from the innermost feeling that recognizes it and gives us a sense of joy about it and we won't take it seriously it'd be like if you have that approach it will be like water off a duck's back and you'll see it in, in as it is that is from the discriminating point of view that this is a drama that is being enacted and because it's a game i have to play it very well so I engage in life with a sporting attitude and you don't head you don't face it head on you do it in a circumvented way so somebody writes doing or serving others can be difficult as there are individuals who keep taking so if i have my i have to adjust my glasses to read this if you keep giving this is unfair is that not so i would get quite resentful of any individual who would keep tanking yes true but what's the problem in it there's no problem in it because you see you have to you have to weigh up the the value of the drama if you don't take it like a drama you're stuck it is not all giving because it's a rule 
it's giving because there's compassion, but there's also discernment in the sense that it doesn't, it doesn't make you the doormat. You have enough common sense to know what to do. Let me give you an example. Anywhere in any city throughout the world, there will be people begging on the streets. It doesn't matter how advanced the country is, somebody will be begging on the streets. The dilemma is, will you generously give everything? Or will you make a reservation? Well, you have to weigh some things up. Supposing you give a, a drug addict money, the drug addict so you know will go and spend it on drugs. But you see, that's, a, that's one thing. Another thing is to give all that money, if you feel strongly about that, to an organization that looks after drug addicts. So that doesn't mean to say you're stupid. Yeah, Ram Krishna has that example, isn't it? You all must know the story of the holy man who goes through a village and he's about to depart. And there's a dangerous cobra there with a great reputation for biting people. And the village people warn him, please don't go this route. He says, what's the problem? He says, it's a dangerous snake. They'll bite you. He says, don't worry. I can deal with it. I know the, some mantras and so on. I can teach this. I can be this snake's guru. He goes along. The snake comes up about to bite. Wait, wait, wait. What do you think you're doing? Disturbing all these people. It's not right. So, oh, I want to reform my ways. All right. I'll take you as a disciple. He teaches him a mantra and tells him, from here on, do not bite anybody. Don't introduce your venom to anybody. See, there are people in this world that have a lot of venom, a lot of hatred. They have to reform. Don't you transform all this? Don't, don't hate anymore, anymore. Don't bite anymore. And the mantra will protect you because a mantra is a protecting thought. And as long as you repeat this with love, the sacred name of God, that will then give you a loving attitude. After some months, he go, comes back, wants to see how is my disciple give, doing. He can't find the snake anywhere. He asks all the village people, where is this? He said, we haven't seen it for a long time, but what we know is it became very mild-mannered. It didn't bite anymore. But then it was so full of nonviolence and non-injury that the small boys understood it and took advantage of it. They used to take it by the tail and dash it against rocks and so on. But you might find it somewhere, I don't know. Nobody's seen it. He looked carefully under all the rocks. And there he finds this thin thing like barbed wire, half conscious. Oh, master, you are here. Yes, what happened to you? You're full of sores and scratches, half conscious. I did what you told me. I never bit anybody. And I, start, I changed my diet. Instead of eating frogs and things, I am now pure vegetarian. Oh, foolish, foolish snake. I told you not to bite. I said nothing about hissing. We can hiss, but don't bite. In other words, we don't have to be a fool. We don't have to allow people to take advantage of us, but by the same token, we should not ever inject venom. There should be no hatred in it, but there should be a reasonable way of playing the game, playing the role, isn't it? So let us see what other thing is there. So it says, yes, give some money to the drug addict, as in that case, he won't go and rob another. Thus preventing years huh, of fears for the person who was robbed. Perhaps give some food to the addict. Yes, I agree. We can give food, but don't give money. Food he can eat. And if the person declines food, that's his problem, his business. That happens, by the way. It happens here in Ireland. I don't know about anywhere else. In Zimbabwe, you know, you would go into any city or town and you'd be surrounded by children 
who are orphans from the AIDS epidemic. A very difficult sight. Your car would be surrounded. So I always used to keep some bread with me and the children would accept the bread, but the adult beggars, they didn't want bread. They wanted money. And I would never give money, I would give food, lots of food. So we have to be sensible is what I'm saying. You have to be compassionate and sensitive, sensible, but in any event, it's God's dressed up like that. All these parts are God playing these parts. And the Bhagavatam says, Krishna says that, I play this Leela, this game on myself. It's not a cruel joke on you. There's only one entity that we have to get used to. The reality is like this. There's only one existence looking like these manifested forms and names. That's the fact of it. This is the message of the Upanishad. And thou art that. Okay. All right. When you're angry, you lose thought and you start cursing. Yes. Where does that lead you to? Yes. So you see the Bhagavad Gita tells us that. It starts from brooding on objects. That is, we feel we have a gap inside and we will need to fill it from outside called desires. When we start ruminating more and more on that, ultimately we become attached and we become, we, ultimately we lose our discrimination. And we become half mad because a thwarted desire results in anger. I want it, I haven't got it, I need it. So the desperation for it increases. Then it becomes a passion, an obsession. And that creates pain because when we don't have it, anger comes. Now, kroda is a word that would really actually describe anything from mild frustration to outbursts of anger. In any event, it's an overreaction. It's in cursing, then causing... But it's not different from a child. So we have this day when, when somebody comes angry, you say, he threw his toys out of the cart. In other words, he behaved as he did when he was four or five years of age. Haven't you grown up since then? So we're all small children, really, at the end of the day, if we haven't matured and grown. And that's the difficulty. Spiritual life is attaining some level of maturity. So we have the capacity then to arbitrate between what we should take and what we shouldn't. This is called discrimination. An arbitrary standpoint where we can judge what is useful to take, what is not useful to take, what will be for the best and highest good, and what will be otherwise. What gives us the greatest strength and what involves the greatest weakness. So the only difference between children and adults is children play with toys and adults play with golf balls. All right, if there's nothing further, leave it there. You see, if we don't have difficult people, what fun is the game? There's no, no fun if we don't have obstacles isn't it, in life. All right. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace beyond all. Oh.